For these concerns, those spoken, those unspoken, let us remember them in our prayers before God. Let us continue our worship by extending the right hand of Christian fellowship to one another, welcoming each other with words of peace and goodwill.
I invite you, my Christian friends, in body or in spirit, please stand and join with me in our call to worship. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders, the Lord over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king of, of forever. May the Lord give strength to the people. May the Lord bless the people for peace. to be sinless, we are self-deceived, and the truth is not in us. Let us therefore confess our sins before Almighty God. O God of mercy, your Son was baptized for the sins of the world, but we have pretended to be faultless. We have no part in his baptism. We have commanded us to renounce our sinful ways, but we have ignored your will and have followed our own. Have mercy on us, O God, and forgive our sin. Make us more faithful disciples, your Son, obeying his word and showing his love. In the name of Jesus, our Christ, and our Savior, we pray. Amen. is a true statement to be universally accepted and believed Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners if we confess our sins he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness my Christian friends we can believe this it is the good news of the gospel in the person of Jesus Christ we stand justified we stand sanctified our sins are forgiven.
I thought today we might talk a little bit about birthdays. Okay. Birthday. Uh, what's a birthday? A birthday is celebrating the new year that you're older. All right. So we celebrate birthdays every year about the to celebrate that we're a year older, right? Okay. What kind of things do we do when we have birthdays? Oh, we have a cake. All right. Some presents. Oh, there are presents when we have a birthday. Right. All right. Those are all things that we do when we celebrate birthday. All right. Let me ask you this. Okay. So if it's your birthday, right, uh, but you don't have a party, and you don't have cake, and you don't have presents, do you still uh, get a year older, or do you just stay the same age? I get a year. Do you think? Yeah. You think you get older? So if you don't have a birthday party, you still you still get a year older? Yeah. Oh, that seems unfair. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not unfair, Dad. If you don't want a birthday party, you don't have to have oh, a birthday right. party. Okay, all right. Like so, you're older. So the fact that you're getting older, just because uh, you celebrate something, right? Actually, if you don't get to celebrate, it doesn't necessarily even happen, right? All right? Okay. So uh, what we're talking today a little bit about baptism. Right. And baptism is sort of like a birthday party, a little bit. All right, we have birthday parties to celebrate the day when you became a part of our family. Right, that's what a birthday party is. It's us remembering that you became a part of our family. And baptisms are sort of the same, but it's with our church family. We have baptisms to celebrate that you're a part of our church family. All right, but you know, not everybody is baptized. Does that mean that they're not part of our church family? They're not part of God's family? No. No. All right. Just because we haven't had the celebration doesn't mean they're not a part of our family. Doesn't mean they're not a part of God's family. Yeah. Right? Okay. Does that make sense? Now, uh, is it better to celebrate than not celebrate? Yeah. yeah. I think so. I'd rather have cake and presents on my birthday than not have cake and presents. <laughs> right? I would rather not have cake okay. and presents. But, you know, just because you haven't necessarily been baptized doesn't mean that you're not a part of God's family. And that's what baptism is, the celebration of family. We I think right. I was baptized when I was a baby. You were, because you have been a part of God's family from the moment you were born and until the end of forever. Was I baptized? You were, because you have also been a part of God's family. Because I saw the picture of the baptism. <laughs> there was a picture. All right, let's pray oh. and thank God for that. All right, I'll say some words and you repeat after me. Dear God, Dear Dear God, God we thank you, we we thank you, you. that we are a part that we are a part of your family. Of your family. Always. Always. And forever. And forever. We pray this. And we pray this. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We can head back to church, or back to the seats, uh, because it's communion, so we're going to go.
As God is glorified by the prayer of the anthem, may God also be glorified by the proclamation of his word. Let us pray. Gracious God, again we come before you, recognizing that the only thing that makes this place, this time, and ourselves holy is the presence of your Holy Spirit in us. We pray that once again you will illumine us in heart and mind, that we may have the same heart and mind that was in Christ Jesus. Do so by your Spirit in us, that the words we read this day and those upon which we meditate in our hearts might be for us the living presence of your Son engrafted into our souls so that we are one with you as you have become one with us and empowered by your word spoken through us this day by your Spirit May we be the hands and feet, the mission and message of your Son to this world. Speak to us your word this day, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our scripture lections for today, uh, one, I'm, I'll be preaching primarily from Mark's gospel today, uh, Mark chapter 1, but I want to uh, supplement that with this reading from uh, the writings of Luke in the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, just a, a quick history there. Uh, the, uh, Luke, the Gospel writer, is also Luke, the writer of the Book of Acts. He wrote a two-volume set, if you will. Uh, in Acts, it's basically the history of the church. Um, the, uh, the first effort we have, the, the first extant effort we see in a church history of a church history. Uh, and here we see primarily the activities of the Apostles, Peter and the Apostle Paul. <coughs> in this particular story, we're going to see that uh, uh, Paul is in Ephesus and comes across uh, some disciples who do not know anything about the presence of God revealed in the Holy Spirit. They don't know how Christ is made real within them by the Holy Spirit, even though they have been baptized. So Paul speaks to them about this, and uh, once he speaks to them about the, the nature of knowing the presence, the reality, uh, the love and justice of Jesus Christ, uh, then they experience the presence of the Holy Spirit in Paul's preaching, in their baptism, and in the living, breathing presence of Jesus Christ in them. Uh, and uh, uh, I want to point out one more thing uh, about the book of Acts. Uh, it's, we call it the Acts of the Apostles. That's the title that we give to that particular writing. We could just as easily have called it the Acts of the Holy Spirit because the way Luke writes this history, nothing happens without the movement, the inspiration, the compulsion of the Holy Spirit at work in the disciples, in the apostles, in everything that takes place, that transpires. In fact, we see the same thing in the way he tells the story of Jesus Christ in the Gospels, the, the events of, of Jesus' life, the major events in uh, Jesus' life are inspired and uh, compelled um, by the Holy Spirit. Uh, <coughs> we see that more so in, in Luke's Gospel, and we certainly see it in the Acts of the Apostles more so than we see it anywhere else in the New Testament. With that as an introduction uh, to this passage in uh, the book of Acts, uh, I uh, listen for the word of God, Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the inland regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, into what then were you baptized? They answered, into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about twelve of them. Here now, this reading from uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. Uh, in this, we are, this is the story of uh, Jesus' baptism, the hands of John the baptizer. And uh, his, this... Uh, uh, 
All uh, the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, report that Jesus was baptized with John's presence. Uh, now, each one, though, is distinct in the way they tell the story. And what's unique about this one, about Mark's telling of the story, is that uh, at Jesus' baptism, the voice of God that speaks and the, the tearing asunder of heaven uh, as heavens are opened at the point of Jesus' baptism is something that is only witnessed by Jesus. It is only, the voice of God is only heard by Jesus in, in the way Mark tells the story. When Matthew tells it, uh, everyone who's there in the River Jordan uh, hears this testimony. But in Mark's Gospel, this is, G this is God speaking directly to Jesus. And that's an important thing to note. Uh, the, uh, we, we learn wonderful uh, theological messages from each of the different ways that the Gospel writers uh, narrate their stories. Uh, in the way Mark narrates the story, we're going to see that when God speaks directly to Jesus and identifies him as, you are my son, we see the personal interrelationship between God the Father, God the Son, and that how it is at this baptism of Jesus and God's declaration that Jesus receives the identity that he has as Son of God. With that again as an introduction, I say again, listen for the word of God, God Mark chapter 4, verses 4 through 11. Now John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and uh, with, a leather, with a leather belt around his waist. And he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. Amen, and may God give us to understand this reading, these readings of his holy word. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, we take the story of the baptism of Jesus for granted in many respects, because most of us theologically believe that uh, if, uh, if, if baptism is a baptism for the repentance of sins, and if we believe that Jesus uh, uh, comes into the world to redeem us of our sins, who himself knows no sin except the sins that he takes on of us in order to redeem, to reconcile us to God, then what was the purpose of his baptism? What does he have to be baptized for? There are no sins that Jesus needs to own. There are no sins he has to answer for. There's no sins from which he needs to be washed thoroughly in the waters of baptism. Why is he baptized? This story in Mark's gospel tells us that the baptism is significant. Uh, let me start also by pointing out a few interesting words that are in this text, uh, because the words, uh, each little word sometimes can be more important than you think. There is this, this wonderful event that only Jesus witnesses in his baptism. We're told that the heavens are torn open. Uh, it's, the, 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 it's a Greek word. It's, the, the Greek word is schizo, to tear or to rip open. Uh, we get the word schizophrenia, by the way, from that Greek word to uh, split something in two. Um, and uh, that word occurs only twice in, uh, in uh, Mark's gospel. And it's theologically significant where those two words appear. At Jesus' baptism, the very start of his public ministry in Mark's gospel, the heavens are torn open, meaning that God now is no longer... Uh, abiding in heaven in a great chasm that is unreachable by humanity. 
the heavens are torn open. God is now present in what's going to happen in the life of Jesus Christ. That's what's, that's what's recognized, that's what's symbolized in this particular story about the heavens being schizo, being torn open. The second place in scripture where this word happens is in chapter 15, verse 38, where the, uh, at Jesus' death, when he dies on the cross, the temple curtain is schizo, torn in two. The curtain which separated the Holy of Holies, the very the presence, the, the dwelling place of God in, in ancient Judaism, that curtain is torn open, ripped open, so that once again, God is now immediately available and present to his people through the baptism and through the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's a lot of power in that word schizo, in the way it's used in this text. But... Back to the baptism, why is Jesus being baptized? Mark narrates a particular uh, uh, event here, uh, unique to us, uh, to the other, uh, from the others, um, similar but unique. The heavens are split open, a voice uh, that we assume the voice of God speaks to him, and the voice says to him, you are my son, speaking directly to Jesus Christ. Now, John continues the vocation of his baptism. We see that, see that in the book of Acts. But certainly, Jesus is of another order, a greater order than John. Because he brings reconciliation for the, alienist, the alienizing that we have engaged in with one another. The, the estrangement that we have engaged with one another and with God through our sins. Jesus is doing something that no one else can do as the Son of God. He is reconciling the world to God and reconciling us to one another, making it possible for even our sins not to be the stumbling block which separates us from the true fellowship, the true love, the true communion that we are to have with one another. This is what this Son of God is doing. And this is why Jesus is baptized. He's baptized and, and identified as the Son of God so that, so that we know, so that he knows his identity and that we too will know that identity in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a, the baptism basically is just a mark of an identity. The baptism in this particular case is simply saying this is who Jesus Christ is. It is at his baptism that he is named. Which is why, by the way, people have gotten into the habit, and I think it's uh, not a, a good theological habit, we've gotten into the habit of talking about christening our children. Um, and we use that word as a substitute for baptism, because we're, maybe we're afraid to talk about our children being baptized. You know? Um, you know, we Presbyterians have no problem baptizing children because we see it as a sign of God's grace acting in the life of this child who was born to Christian parents. And, and so we, we accept it as grace. And yet there are some of us in our Christian faith that, that is uncomfortable with baptism when someone doesn't make that choice as children cannot yet make. Uh, God is already active in the life of the child, and that's why we baptize. Instead, people want to call it a christening. And uh, that, that sounds prettier. Uh, but the word christen means to give a name to. It means to name someone. And because it, traditionally that's when a person got their name. Uh, children were named their names at their baptism. So associated with the baptism was their christening. So when parents come to me and say, would you christen my child? Uh, you know, I'll say, okay, Henry. Um, <laughs> uh, um, you know, they really don't want me to name their child. Uh, so it's a, so a, just an important theological lesson right there. Um, if you present your child for baptism, you get to name your child, okay? <laughs> um, you get to christen the child. That's, uh, that's what christening is. It's the naming. Um, and that's an important distinction. But note what's happening here. Jesus is being identified. He's being named. He's receiving his identity from God. You are my son, the beloved. With you I'm well pleased. So what are we to say about our own baptism, my Christian friends? When we are, uh, as, as these uh, disciples that were baptized by Paul in the name of Jesus Christ, suddenly the same thing is happening for them. Not that they are declared the Son of God, but what is happening is that they are too in baptism are receiving their identity, an identity tied up to them in Jesus Christ. This is an important thing to note. Why are we baptized? 
Is it for the remission of sin? Well, maybe so, but there's more going on there. If it's just like what's happening with Jesus in his baptism here in Mark's gospel, this baptism is also a baptism to our identity. And if God is the one who tells Jesus who he is, then it's God who's also telling us in our baptism who we are. In Mark, the baptism of Jesus establishes his, his identity. Note, if you read some of the writings of the Apostle Paul, he says the same thing about all believers. He's going to say that uh, uh, just as Jesus is identified by God, so we are identified by God in our baptism. Here's how Paul writes it in Galatians. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. In our baptism, God is claiming us. God is telling us who we are. We are his adopted and redeemed sons and daughters. We are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. You know, Joel's right, of course, the, the sprinkling of water or the dunking of a person in water is not necessarily going to make you the child of God. But why not celebrate, as Joel says? If, if, we, if, if our identity comes from God telling us, in Christ, we are his children, we are sons and daughters of God, then let's own that, let's celebrate it. That's what baptism is supposed to be. It's supposed to be the celebration that we recognize God has laid claim to us. God has identified us as his children. It matters. Baptism matters because we are who God says we are. We are who God says we are. The, and, and, and by the way, let me also point out the importance of that identity. The identity declared at baptism, however, is only a word until it's revealed. I may walk around bearing the title Son of God, Children of God, we may all walk around that way. God has called us. God has claimed us. God has identified us as his adopted and redeemed children. Just as he gave the identity to Jesus Christ. But note, the identity he gives to Jesus Christ only comes to fruition when Christ does the Son of God thing. When he makes that ministry a reality. When he puts into practice his identity. When he becomes the one who is going to suffer and die on the cross for the sins of the world. And subsequently be raised from the dead as a vindication that he is well pleased in God's eyes. You and I are the adopted and redeemed sons and daughters of God. But it's just a word until we put that into practice. Be the sons and daughters of God. Live your life as though you are saved. Live your life as though you are a child of God. I'm not asking for perfection. I, you know, I ask that of myself and I fall far short. Uh, I don't dare ask for perfection. But I am saying, as children of God, let us do our best to live like brothers and sisters to one another. As those who are working for the reconciliation of the world. Not that you and I can attain it by ourselves, but we can be a part of that reconciliation made real in Jesus Christ. Put on Christ and recognize your own baptism. I want to finish with this by when I say recognize your own baptism. Uh, uh, speaking about one of my favorite theologians and spiritual heroes of the past, Martin Luther. Martin Luther, if anyone, if any theologian in history knew the problems of the weight of the church would press down against him, it would be Martin Luther. Uh, Martin Luther lived a very hard life given the fact that uh, at any moment the church authorities would be coming after him. Uh, and uh, living with that fear and that trepidation, Martin Luther reportedly would uh, periodically touch his forehead and say to himself, I have been baptized. I have been baptized. Reminding himself that he is a child of God. No matter how bad life gets, no matter how horrible the world is in telling us how, how much um, we are rotten and terrible, 
Like Martin Luther, I say to you, my Christian friends, own your identity. Remember, you have been baptized. Remember, you are a child of God. Amen, and may God bless this witness to the glory of his name. Christian faith to which we have been called in the proclamation of the word, let us reaffirm that faith using the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, 
and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Son Jesus Christ, who at his baptism bore the title of Son of God. We give you thanks that at our baptism you have laid claim to us, you have identified us, you have called us your adopted and redeemed children. May we live as your sons and daughters, may we live as brothers and sisters to Christ and to one another. Make us truly grateful for the identity we have, and may we bring it to reality in the same way that your Son did, in faithful service to this world and to one another. This we pray in Christ's most holy name, he who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's at this point in our service of worship that we continue recognizing the sacrifice that God has made for us in the person of Jesus Christ. And we do so in our worship by also, presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice, may we give of ourselves in our time, our talent, our treasures, in the very ministry that we practice in the name of Jesus Christ. During the time of the offertory, may we reflect on our own self-giving as a continuation of our worship.
that were it not for the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ, we would not be able to stand before you this day. We give you thanks for all that you have done for us through your Son, in his baptism, his life and death and resurrection. Receive, we pray, these tokens as our faithful response to all the sacrifice he offered and the sacrifice which we offer for the service of your love to one another. This we pray in Christ's most holy name. Amen. You may be seated. My Christian friends, this is the table of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. People will come from east and west, north and south, to be a part of this covenant established for us in this common meal. This is not a Presbyterian table. It is the Lord's table. And all of God's people are invited to come and be a part of the covenant that he has established for us. Giving, taking something that is so human, something that every human being must do, and that is eat and break bread together. He has transformed its meaning so that we become one with Christ and the sacrifice that he made for us. And, and we become part of the call that he sends us out into the world. Let this sacrament be that for us this day. I invite everyone who has penitent hearts, all who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, to come, taste and see that the Lord is good. The invitation has gone out for 2,000 years. It goes to us this day. Let us pray. O holy God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, with joy we give you thanks and praise. In being baptized by John in the Jordan's water, Jesus identified himself with sinners, and your voice proclaimed him as your son. Like a dove, your spirit descended on him, anointing him as the Christ, sent him out with good news to preach, to serve the poor and to proclaim release to the captives, to recover sight for the blind, to set free the oppressed, to announce that the time has come when you would save your people. We praise you that in our baptism we are joined to Christ and with all the baptized are called to share in his ministry. How wonderful are your ways, almighty God, how marvelous is your name. You alone are God, and therefore with apostles and prophets and that great cloud of witnesses who live for you beyond all time and space, we lift our hearts in joyful praise. We praise you, most holy God, for sending your only Son, Jesus Christ, to live among us full of grace and truth. He made you known to all who received him, and sharing our joy and sorrow, he healed the sick and was a friend of sinners. Obeying you, he took up his cross and died, that we might live. We praise you that... He has overcome death and has risen to rule the world, and that he remains a friend of sinners. We trust him to overcome every power that can hurt or divide us, and we believe that when he comes in glory, we will celebrate victory with him. Therefore, in remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we take this bread and this cup and give you praise and thanksgiving. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that this bread and this cup may be for us the body and blood of our Lord and that we and all who share this feast may be one with Christ, as he is one with us. Fill us with eternal life, that with joy we may be his faithful people until we feast with him in glory. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, and in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ took bread, and after getting thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Those who believe in me shall never hunger, and those who follow shall never thirst. In like manner, after the disciples had eaten, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ took the cup and said, This is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood. Drink, do so in remembrance of Jesus Christ. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we do proclaim the Lord's death until he returns.
Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing. Once again, let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the very common elements of the earth that you have transformed in the new meaning by the presence of your spirit abiding within us. Remind us that the sacredness of this sacrament resides not in anything inherent within the elements themselves, but by your holiness abiding in us, making us holy. May we be holy only in the name of Jesus Christ who sends us forth into the world, empowered by this covenant, empowered by your word, empowered by your Holy Spirit, to be the living and breathing presence of God's grace. This we pray in Christ's most holy name. Amen. you my Christian friends to go in peace, live as free people, serve the Lord rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and always. Mm -hmm.